and good evening you too. It's the old soldier coming at you on Saturday evening, somewhere in the vicinity of 7, 7, 15 tonight. My apologies for this video coming out late. Um, just got carried away doing other things today, but I did promise you a his history video. So what I chose to do was to talk about what well, in U.S. military parlance, become an icon, if you will. Um, it certainly has affected fashion, in a sense, since the time of its uh, invention, lack of a better term. But the 19, or what they call it, the M1943 or M43 field jacket. Hmm. Well, I wonder where 43 came from. Well, that would be 1943, when it was more or less developed and issued. Uh, it was designed as a general purpose replacement for the M1941 or what's referred to as the Parsons Field Jacket. Uh, due to the design flaws with that, was, that, that jacket was uh, too short. Um, you could put things in the pockets, but once you put the pistol belt on, it hampered getting to those pockets and items you put in there. Um, the flannel lining in it was not really sufficient for uh, winter environments, maybe a fall time type environment um, and its color there's a, uh, the color was too light um, and U.S. forces after the initial D-Day invasion took to turning that jacket inside out to blend better in the French hedgerows uh, and of course that was 1944 and you said well that jacket was developed in 1943 so so like the army the army like any, any other Entity, government organization, what you will, what you want, uh, always has to test things and always looking for an improvement, this, that, and the other. But the 1943, why it's so iconic, and if you didn't know, that's what I'm wearing right now, is a reproduction M1943 field jacket. Um, it was a pretty heavy, tightly woven cotton garment. It was designed to be windproof and water resistant not repellent resistant what that means is you know uh it, it'll it'll keep water at bay for a short amount of time but in a heavy downpour <laughs> it can get soaked um but that was all right uh so the army developed this field jacket it came with four pockets you had two upper chest pockets and you had two lower skirt pockets. And the other neat, unique thing about it, all the buttons on this jacket, when this thing was buttoned up as far as the closure and the, and the pockets went, were covered. So when you, if you had to unbutton the pocket, get say, put something in there, take something out. Once you button it back up and... Uh, Closed flat down, the buttons were hidden. Okay, and that was handy in two purposes. One, they didn't reflect when they got wet because you can't see them. And two, if you had to get on your belly and low crawl somewhere, the buttons didn't get hung up on everything in sight. The other nice thing about this particular jacket is Mark Clark, General Mark Clark, like. Because his army was the first one to get them. And I've done a video on this jacket before, but I just thought I'd touch base again with it. Um, was the fact that his soldiers made the comment that they could fight out of the pockets because there was so much room in the pockets. And, and certainly there is a lot of room in all the pockets. Um, there's a lot of gear that you can put in these pockets. First aid dressing, grenades, magazines, spare ammunition. Uh, you could even put C rations in the upper pocket well, or any of the pockets for that matter. So, like I said, tightly thick woven cotton outer shell, lightweight cotton inner liner. Okay, there was a liner for this, an actual um, what they called a uh, wool fur type liner for this to give additional insulation. Not every soldier got that during World War II. 
Um, the liner would become more popular at the end of the war, uh, but also the Korean War. As a, and it could be the, and what was neat about the liner for this coat was that it could be worn as an outer garment by itself. It just didn't have as much windbreaking property as, say, this one did. Um, during the Korean War, a lot of troops were issued with a liner because there was a shortage of the jackets. Uh, and then the Army dipped into the old 1941s they had in stock and did an emergency issue of those as well. But long story short, the, the forces in Italy got these first. And these were eventually initially tested by the 1st Special Forces Service Brigade. Okay? Um, known as the, the Devil's Brigade in some parlance. Uh, and they, they, they brought back just wonderful and remarkable um, reports of, of how well this jacket performed. You know, it was spacious. It was voluminous. The pockets were great. Uh, you could put on one or two sweaters underneath for additional insulation, you know, because um, you can realize World War II soldier, we didn't have, you know, they didn't have polypro, they didn't have these, these lightweight, ultra warm fabrics, you know, synthetic fabrics we have today. So everything they had was a cotton wool blend, uh, a lot of times, sometimes just 100% wool blend. Um, but even if, if you only think about wool, wool is a good, good insulator, but even then, sometimes you need something that's going to block the wind to keep the, the wind out and that's where cotton cotton can be woven a little bit tighter than wool for in that respect uh and it's cheaper to produce cotton too you know um but it was a good garment um you know i wear mine and it's getting time to start wearing mine I, I mean i've been wearing my other new jacket that i showed you a while back too um I love the feel of it. It's heavy. It's durable. That's the other thing. These were very durable, whereas the old 1941s frayed more out real quick. Um, these had some lasting power to them. Uh, so much so that, you know, the Army kept it in the inventory all the way up into the late 50s, early 60s. And what I mean by it, and even then it was just, a, all they did was they continued to modify. But this was the basic design now that gave us what we know as the M65 field jacket. That, this is where it started from, people. Right here, the M1943 or the M43, whichever nomenclature you want to use. There's always arguments about which one it truly was. Um, tag I've got says jacket field M1943. I bought this from a reputable World War II uh, reproduction company called What Price Glory out of Salinas, California. Um, at the front carries them as well. And, they're, and both of them are very reasonably priced, too. If you want to buy one, yeah, go to either one of them, at the front or what price glory. Um, I would tell you, you won't be disappointed with the, the quality of from either company. Uh, like I said, I love mine. It's comfortable. Uh, but back to the soldier's opinion of it. So, the soldiers in Italy got them after the first Special Service Force uh, had tested them. But... Let's jump over to the European Theater of Operations. It's getting close to D-Day. Um, the Army's tired of specialty uniforms. I, they were mad at the airborne community because they had a special combat uniform while the average soldier had wool pants, wool shirt, and the 1941 jacket with ankle boots and leggings. And the paratroopers had this nice four-pocket tunic with pants with these voluminous pockets. Um, and that's another thing, 1943 had a set of special trousers. They were actually over trousers. They were designed to be worn over the wool pants. Um, I don't have any because neither reproduction company makes them as super, super duper, 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 super duper, extra, 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 extra grindy, big, broad soldier size. Uh, yes, I'm saying I've got a big rear end um, and they don't make any big enough for me. But uh, the 1943 pants came along with the jacket when they were issued. Um, the Airborne Forces, they kind of had to go to their rigor section and get modifications made to get some hip pockets put on theirs because they love their, their hip pockets. Why? Because when they go into combat, they get everything they carry is what they've got. So, but the 1942 jump uniform gave them that, but the Army wanted to standardize. So, psh, uh, but Eisenhower and Bradley, particularly Bradley, Bradley had made the comment that it, he didn't he didn't care for the 1943 garment, didn't look soldierly enough, this, that, and the other. There's a whole litany of excuses why they didn't want it. And um, part of it was the old World War I mentality of, of 
wool was a better garment um looked better yeah go on down the line it's just typical simple military mind this is what i call it um even in today's army we we they have that um you know the debacle with the acus versus multicam when it first you know and then now the asu to the new pinks and greens so anywho anyhow anyway everybody has opinions uh but the 1943 would go on and later be modified into the 1950. The difference being is that on the 1943, there was no buttons on the inside to button in a liner. The 1950 added those buttons. So a liner could be buttoned in so the coat and liner stayed together if you wanted it that way. The other nice thing about both the 50 and the 43, it had an internal uh, drawstring waistband so that you could modify for fit uh which is another comforting factor because i believe it or not by cinching this up at the waist it kind of helped retain heat in the upper torso region too because it wouldn't let air flow up under the skirt portion of the jacket uh and get into the rest of the body you could do that and then they came out with the m1951 that was where we begin to see snaps replacing buttons and zippers replacing buttons um and there was also a waist drawstring and a skirt drawstring starting with the m1951 model and that would the m1951 would would run with the army all the way up into the mid to late 60s okay about 1964 they came out with an experimental jacket uh and then it became the, the T65, which eventually became the M19 or the M65 field jacket, which for many veterans today can remember those. You know, all the pockets snapped. You had a zipper. The only modifications they made to it was um, the addition of Velcro for the glove flaps. Uh, had a Velcro neck tab for, for the Mandarin collar. Had an internal hood. Okay. Whereas with the 1943. Um, I don't know if you can see it here, but you see these two buttons here on the collar? Believe it or not, these are actually to allow for the buttoning on of an external hood if you wanted to put the hood on. Um, but the 1965, that put it in there. Most of us old soldiers in my, in my generation, we cut that hood out. We were never allowed to wear them anyway, so why keep it in there? You take that out, close the zipper, starch, iron, pfft, collar looked great. If you left that hood in there, yeah. You know, kind of look, eh. Um, that and they started modifying by putting plastic zippers in versus the old brass zippers. Um, and I got to Germany, I made the mistake, turned my field jacket in one time to the 80s cleaners. And the, this is when they put a ban on pressing the field jackets because plastic zippers have a tendency to heat under the high heat of the steam presses. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know enough that I could have gone to downtown to a, a fabric store or something and found a brass zipper and had them replaced. But, you know, hey, it is what it is. Uh, but again, this iconic field jacket set the pace and the tone for military field jackets. Not only in the United States, there were several other nations around the world that adopted this type of pattern of field jacket. Um, some just downright by, by buying, buying or were given old U.S. surplus stocks. Um, it's a great piece of gear, um, and it's comparable, like I said, to a lot of other nations, and wait right there, because I'm going to show you another jacket I've got. What I'm about to show you now, and I believe this is the second pattern, British. World War II Parasmock. Again, check it out. Now, the British, I think, had this before our 1943. We may have drawn some inspiration from it. Got two upper patch pockets, two lower patch pockets. See, the difference being is theirs is a patch, meaning it's sewn over the outer material, whereas our lower skirt pockets were internal. Um, but another good piece of garment, like I said, similar in style to the M1943, um, heavy cotton, this thing right here by itself, and this this the, the, the quarter zip one. Um, later on, they would begin ma manufacturing these in with a full zip version. But again, like I said, 
you can see the, the style here. You've got all these pockets, they're volumes, you can put gear in them, you can take belts off if you have to, and just fight out of the pockets. Um, and these, like I said, were British Airborne Forces of War. And, and to this day, they still wear, to this day, they still wear a version of this in their new multi-cam pattern. Okay, to include the crotch skirt. Whoa, what? A white old soldier? The crotch skirt. This would snap underneath the paratroopers' crotch. Thus, when they jumped out of a perfectly good airplane, as some of you like to say they are, supposedly kept the jacket from riding up as you descended out of the aircraft. Many took to having this piece either removed or permanently sewn into the back and out of the way. Um, I leave mine the way it is, the way I bought it. And again, I got this from What Price Glory. I think they had them on sale when I bought it for $75. And yes, I have wore this many times too. It is a thick, heavy, duty, twilled cotton. Very soft. Oh my goodness, it's soft. And it has this wool flannel collar. And it's got knit wool elastic cuffs down here. Um, so... But again, the whole the whole point of it is that that Army started in World War II realizing that that the old bulky thick wool uniforms were not weren't very effective. Um, even the British battle dress, you know, they went from at the beginning of the World War II from a four pocket tunic uh, to their version, or they're they're the ones that kind of started what we refer to as the ice jacket and their battle dress. Um, but even then, they would take to putting things over that to give them other options. Uh, and, and honestly, the British maintained that form of battle dress in some shape, form, or variation all the way through the 60s. Um, they had a denim version, which from what I understand, was a whole lot better than the wool version. Go figure. But, like I said, the 1943 field jacket, phenomenal piece of gear. Um... And just to think the what it influenced to this day in military uniform design and development. Um, just like the jungle fatigues were inspired by the 1942 jump jacket. Bet you didn't know that. Officer by the name of General Yarbrough was a young captain in the 509th Parachute Infantry Battalion, uh, or Parachute Battalion. Um, he was the one that designed the modern jump wing we wear today. He also designed the jump boot and, well, modified the jump boot. Um, the original jump boots that were in consideration were smoke jumpers. Um, so they had them before World War II, if you didn't know that. And they wore a boot with kind of ankle strap. But anyway, um, General Yarborough designed the, the 1942 jump uniform and would later use that as a, a design feature for the the jungle fatigue, which would eventually transition eventually into what we know as the BDUs. So kind of see how things kind of progress from there. Like I said, functional uniforms versus appearance. Okay. Um, even at the beginning of World War II, we were we were more focused on appearance than function. You know, we would send so you know, we would consider sending soldiers into battle either wearing um khakis if it was in a tropic or a hot weather environment to wool in a winter environment, which like in, in a winter environment, wool is a good insulator, but is it necessarily uh, a functional uniform for combat? That was the thing. The uh, both the khakis and the wool pre World War II were rather restrictive in the sense that they were kind of cut with a tighter, slim fit. Um, and now you want the soldier that carries all this gear, and it restricts their movements, it makes it kind of hard for them to get to and from on the battlefield. So they already begin to wisen up and realize that. They needed garments that had more room in the seat and the thighs and more room in the shoulder and more length on the sleeves. Um, but they also needed uniforms that would be functional, things that they could carry in the pockets into battle uh, without the need of always constantly having to take a backpack off or find a, you know, a haversack, whatever the case may be. And the 1943 fit that bill. Now, you're saying, well, that's only good for early wintertime. Yeah, yeah. Um, but eventually what we see towards the end of World War II is that the U.S. Army transitioned from wearing a lot of wool garments to um, the green fatigues or the fatigue uniforms. 
you know they found those to be a pretty good solution for a combat uniform um which would eventually develop along the lines through the 50s uh to the old pickle suits that you'd see people wearing that you'd starch the crap out of that you know in that sense the term breaking starch it's like the khakis the khakis during world war ii the beginning of world war ii were they were they were designed really more for a garrison environment even though they were supposed to be a dual uniform that was the problem with the army too they wanted the dual uniform it's just like the class a uniform for world war ii um was a for officer were enlisted was a four pocket tunic open collar with lapels with a wool shirt and a tie and wool pants that was supposed to be their dress uniform and it was also supposed to be their go to war uniform now you can see the problem here if anybody's ever been to a filthy dirty muddy environment you know um wool is not the easiest thing to clean especially considering most wool garments usually do better if they are dry cleaned as opposed to being washed by soap and water um and that was the other thing about going to cotton uniforms and now most uniforms are some type of synthetic fiber uh, or a blend of cotton and synthetic fibers but uh, the whole thing was that the army realized you can't have a dress uniform at and a combat uniform rolled into one. It just it's just not feasible. It's just not gonna work. So eventually by the end of the war your class A uniform was class A's and you had a separate uniform that you went and fought in. Um but if you see any pictures of World War II soldiers, they got the brown olive drabish pants and shirt. That was the same pants and shirt that they would wear with their class A uniforms. Okay. Um I forget the what the issue in numbers was. I'd have to go pull a book that I can't seem to find right now. Um, that's got those tables in there of what every soldier was issued in World War II. Um, and like I said, again, wool preferring to be dry cleaned versus, you know, washed in a traditional washing machine. So again, like I said, 1943 was a great advent towards that. And also for further uniform development down the line. Um, Korean War, we would see that the Army uh, had a bad habit of repeating its, its history, or just our nation in general. We were woefully inadequately prepared for a, another war when it started. Um, but not only were we having to supply our Army, we were having to supply the, Kore you know, the South Korean Army. And then come to find out, we, you know, when, when the UN started sending allies over, the United States basically got tasked with supplying our allies. Okay, so if you see pictures in World War or, or in the Korean War where Allied troops are wearing this, it's because we were kind of tasked with providing them that combat uniform. Some would arrive, like the British, they would arrive with their own combat uniform, and it was fairly effective. Um, but there are some some pictures that I've seen of British Royal Marines wearing 1943 pants and jacket. Okay, um, again, it was it was a very versatile piece of equipment um so much so like i said you, you'll see um uh, in europe many variations of the 1943 style field jacket that was adopted by the other european nations and then they put their own little twist to them but again it just hard wearing garment so, I, I've rambled on enough tonight about this, folks, but I, I promised you a video today or this evening with some, some historical background to it. I hope you got something out of this. Um, feel free to leave something in the comment section, what you think about it, or if you know something that I don't about these particular garments, throw them in the comment section. I'd love to see what you got to say about it, or any other subject or topic you'd like me to talk on uh, in, in regards to military history. What I don't know, I will do my best to research and find out and get back to you on that. Uh, but certainly, your feedback will help drive the train on what we talk about on our Saturday nights. So, with that being said, everybody have a blessed and wonderful evening. Again, I just ask you to support the charities that I'd ask you to help out. Tunnels to Towers, Pin Up for Vets and Valor for Veterans. They can't do it by themselves. If you could help them, they would certainly appreciate it. I would certainly appreciate it. Uh, vendors, if you live in my part of North Carolina, there's Money Quick Pawn on Rayford Road. It's where I go to for all my firearms and ammunition need, needs in this area. Uh, great bunch of folks out there. They're honest and just 
phenomenal atmosphere when you walk in the store from the first moment. Uh, Robert's Custom Woodwork on his Etsy site, Unsung Patriot. And like I said, help me out. Get a couple of my books, Thoughts of an Old Soldier's, now $10 on Amazon. And Old Soldier's Poetry and Prose of Life, Love, and Liberty is now $15 on Amazon. And I also have my uh, Teespring's website uh, where I've got a couple t-shirts, sweatshirts, that kind of thing going for sale. And I have now got a Patreon established. Uh, if you'd like to be a, uh, a Patreon on it and, and, and join that, um, the funds I'll, I'll use from there will to buy will be to buy their reproduction gear and, and get them sent here and do do a video on those. Um, you'll also see that if you you join, um, your first donation will get you a signed copy of Thoughts of an Old Soldier. So, you know. Go down and just check it out. And let me know. But other than that, folks, God bless. Take care. And until Monday with our live Monday, 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 seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 1900 for you military types like me, um, we'll be doing our live poetry chat. So don't miss it. Set your clock so you so you be there on the side chat. Look forward to hearing from you. So God bless. Take care. Soldier out.